Welcome to the Safety Share, a webinar series brought to you by CIM Magazine and the CIM Health and Safety Society. I am your organizer, Michelle Beacom, Managing Editor of CIM Magazine. Today's presentation, is sponsored by Equinox Gold, is Leveraging Diversity to Improve Safety. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. To ensure you have optimal audio, if you joined by computer, make sure you've selected the computer audio button. If you joined by phone, please make sure you've selected the phone call button. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the GoToWebinar control panel question box, and we will hold the questions until the end of the presentation. Note that we will have some poll questions during the presentation, so pay attention. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We are excited to be partnering with the Health and Safety Society to be able to bring this series to you. I'm very happy to have Nelson Bonderchuk with us to both to host and help make this series happen. Nelson is treasurer for CIM's Health and Safety Society and vice president for health and safety at Torx Gold Resources. Welcome, Nelson. Thanks, Michelle. And thanks to everybody who's joined the call today. There's a few things going on around CIM that I know uh, could draw people away, but this will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel. Um, and again, thanks to our sponsors at Equinox Gold for sponsoring today's uh, webinar. It's a pretty important uh, topic, I think. So in today's episode of the Safety Share, our panel will be discussing how Canadian miners can leverage diversity, equity, and inclusion to improve health and safety performance in our mines and processing plants. Our guest speakers today are Kathy Mulroy, a retired process laborer and surface safety instructor, and the author of My View from the Blackened Rocks, A Woman's Battle for Equality and Respect in Canada's Mining Industry. Also, we've got Teresa Nayabis, uh, a PN who has over, worked over 20 years in the mining industry and is the chair of CIM's Diversity Inclusion Advisory Committee. And John Doyle joins me again as a guest speaker. He's a principal at Solution Stream. He's been working with organizations for a little while to optimize and align strategy implementation in a safe and healthy work environment. So we're gonna open up the conversation today, folks, welcome. And uh, I'd like to just start with a little bit of like the beginning, the middle and the end. That's kind of how we're gonna go today. And tell us a little bit about your experiences when you started in the industry, um, what it was like in the early days, what challenges did you run into, and when did you notice things starting to shift with respect to attitudes towards health and safety? And the nice thing is I think we got a good cross section of folks on the call today from different generations as well as different aspects of the industry from supply chain to, to operations. So Kathy, I was wondering if you could open up with, uh, with your experiences. Sure, I'd love to. Well, I started working in the mining industry in 1974. I was 19 years old, and I was one of the first women that started working at this company, uh, except during the war years. Uh, women were not allowed because it was illegal for women to hold these jobs. Well, in 1974, there wasn't much safety in health. Uh, we were put on a job and said, this is how you do it, and that was pretty well it, and then you just did it. Uh, it wasn't until uh, when the Ham Commission uh, came out, and that is, uh, they had some new rules that came out for health and safety. They they organized, um, a, a created an OSHA committee. That was the Occupational Health and Safety Act. And mostly the responsibilities always fell upon the employer, but now it was going to be the supervisors and the workers were supposed to hold these um, these responsibilities. So in our departments, we had OSHA committees where you had five people of the workers and five people in management. And what that created was a culture that we could be participating in. Because with that new law, you there were three rights came in, which was the right to participate, the right to know, and the right to refuse unsafe work which got young people like myself at the time really involved in safety where you were participating in what the jobs were going to do and how you were going to do them by writing up safety manuals and job description and being part of it and things did start changing over the years 
So that's where I'll stop for now. <laughs> Carissa, could you uh, could you give us uh, your perspective on it? The question. Uh, and, and just Nelson, uh, so, so the question is around uh, experiences at the start of careers, right? Huh? Yeah, yeah. When you're beginning your careers, and how did you see things shift over the last two decades? Yeah, so I started working in mining 20 years ago, and I gotta say, I walked into an industry that was very clearly obsessed with safety. Uh, I remember learning about the Neil George system, memorizing uh -huh. the steps to take when you go into a workplace, and it was very clear to me uh, that safety was paramount. Something that actually, as we were, was preparing for this webinar that I reflected on is, when I was actually in university, that's actually a time I must say, I didn't really understand the connection between the work of mining and the safety consciousness of the industry. It's something that I really, really appreciated once I joined the industry. Uh, so I will say that 20 years ago when I got into the industry, uh, there was a, you know, a, a real, um, you could tell that safety was paramount in what we did. Uh, and 20 years later, you know, I'm really glad to say that I've just seen an evolution of be it technology, be it philosophies around risk management. So I, I really see, um, I see us having continuously progressed and lots of continuous improvement in the industry. Excellent. And John, could you, uh, you have a little bit of a different perspective. You were in a different part of the industry when you started and. Yep. Yeah, my, yeah, absolutely right. Mine was uh, different. I started out in the explosives industry or my early part of my career was in the explosives industry. So it was supplier to the mining industry. And I had the benefit of traveling across the country and visiting uh, uh, many different mining operations. So I got the perspective of not just seeing one company, but seeing many, many companies. And of course, part of the service that we provided was the, the safe handling and the application of explosives. So how do we, how to build more control from a safety perspective into the application of explosives. So we always had that perspective, uh, but it was kind of interesting growing up in, in DuPont as I did, there was a world leader in safety and, uh, and uh, with a business that started out in the family developing explosives, losing a few <laughs> members of the family explosives, it became the number one priority. And it was clear to me working for them as a student, working for them in the early part of my career, that safety was a priority. And I'd have to say that in a mining industry, you know, in those early years, um, certainly the commitment was there and espoused, but uh, the actions and the discussions usually talked about production and how do we get to production. And I would say that because of it early on the learning curve, I would say that there also wasn't a belief. I would have the benefit of leaving the explosives industry and working in operations for DuPont for a couple of years and coming back and talking about the plants that we had that we had celebrated 25 years without a lost time injury. And I was told very clearly that mining is different, our hazards are different. And and but 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 the progression, the learning, the belief has taken us to I think if we look at Ontario in the last year, mining is as safe as manufacturing in terms of uh, of 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 uh, serious or of um, safety incidents. So the industry has progressed a tremendous amount uh, in that from a time of not believing it was possible to espousing that safety was important, but only talking about production to the point that we're now have come a long way. But, you know, as we've uh, talked in the introduction, but we've also plateaued too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's always those, uh, I, I look at a lot of charts that show um, kind of fatalities, specifically in Ontario, that's the easiest data for me to get a hold of. Yeah. Um, and there's a, there's a clear drop in fatalities in underground mines uh, it, with the introduction of McLean Bolter, right? Like that was a big, that was a big step change in our industry from a fatality perspective. Um, and I, I can tell you now from, from the charts I look at, you'll see a lot of companies go down into the, like the below one on 1.0 on, on lost time injury frequencies and total injury frequencies. And they'll have zero fatality year, zero fatality year, but then you'll suddenly have two fatalities or a fatality here and there. And that's where, I think that's what everybody struggles with, right? We're, we're, we're putting a lot of work into it. And, and the technology's there. There's there's social aspects that we've got to we've got to focus on now that we're starting to get into. Um, so before I move on to the poll question, any other highlights or lowlights anybody wants to throw out there from from maybe later on in their career as they start things progress and change? Like, so open open to whoever wants to jump into that first. 
maybe I can. Um, one of the things that I, I did, I will say later on in my career, I noticed was a big emphasis on psychological safety and promoting environments where people would feel comfortable and confident. Uh, they could speak up without, uh, uh, without any uh, negative consequences. So I did see that happening in industry where the message was being reinforced and uh, really amplified across the industry uh, that um, you, know, you needed to create environments within teams where people felt safe to speak up, be innovative, come up with concerns, come up with great ideas. Yeah. That, that to me gets back to that inclusion, right? Everybody feels like they're part of the team and they can speak up when they need to, right? That's a great, great point there. Michelle, yeah. could you bring up poll question number one? So I'm gonna flip the, the attention now to the, the folks on the call in the audience. Um, and the, the question on the screen, how could a more inclusive work environment improve safety? So, We've got five options there. I'm interested to hear from the audience on what they think the top the top item is. We'll give it a couple minutes here. There's about, about halfway through in the polling. Not a couple minutes, a couple seconds. Poll lasts for about a minute. Okay, so we've got about, I'm just looking for where the, just over 60% voted there. Give it a couple more seconds. So far, you know, the 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 leader there with 32%, we'll see how it finishes up, but team culture that addresses hazards in real time seems to be the big winner, the close second. So can we post those results, Michelle? Two. There we go. So team yeah. culture that addresses hazards real time and open cross team communication collaboration. And third place, a more respectful culture across the workplace. So any anybody want to make a comment on on maybe the top two or three there that were Yeah, that I'll were do that. I'll yeah. do that. Um I think that uh, the respect I, I chose the respectable culture. Um, and I think that praising people for their skills, their strength, their accomplishment, and make, maybe using that what if factor. Let's say that a worker notices that there's an accident or an in incident, right? And he brings it to the boss's attention. Well, it takes a little energy for that employee to have a pat on the back and say, add a girl, add a boy. What that does is it causes um, a great motivator and it makes people feel valued and respected. And the chances are that if this same person sees something later on, he's not going to have any problem bringing it to the boss. But if that boss rejects him or his, his ideas and says, ah, oh, no, don't worry about it, it's been like that for weeks, the chances of them bringing it up again to the boss is going to be slim. So a little bit of that goes a long way. <laughs> any further comment on that, Teresa, John? Yeah, and uh, I think you know the the collaborative side as well. I mean, the 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 best way for us to make sure that everybody takes ownership for for uh, risk identification, risk mitigation, is to engage um, the entire team in the conversations that we have about identifying risks. You know, to the point that Kathy made, so people are be comfortable to come forward and talk about what works, what doesn't work. That if there's a change occurring, that people will offer their perspectives from all levels of the organization to make sure that uh, the 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 change is going to be adopted in a way that that is uh, ensures safety and ensures uh, that we recognize the risk that to be mitigated so the only way to be sure that everybody's on the same page and the only way that we get a level of ownership for safety across the organization is to be, have people engaged absolutely yeah for sure that i mean I, I really i resonate with that and i think it's it's it starts with being intentional um you know i don't think teams automatically get into these type of environments where uh, people are feeling like they they are their voices need to be part of the problem solving so i think one thing i would say is that just to make stress that whole leadership the leadership competency in in being able to equitably engage people in your team 
And when I say equitably, it then you kind of get back to like, well, what prevents people from behaving equitably to all team members? And now you start to get into things like, you know, the unconscious bias you might bring into the workplace that keeps you, prevents you from listening to some people versus other people. And so then it becomes a more holistic, you know, problem uh, problem where you, where you see that there are fundamentals that need to ha happen in the workplace, the training that needs to be in place to level set the behaviors that are expected of leaders and then also their team members. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Something as simple as uh, loudest loudest voice in the room isn't always right, right? Oh. So you've got you've got the quiet introverted person sitting in the corner with a good idea and everybody's <laughs> arguing about the idea because the three extroverts are 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 yelling it out and then and then they skip that right so it's a as a leader it's a good great point like you just step back and say what can i do to make sure everybody's got a got a voice on the team there right mm -hmm. um there was also something that was mentioned in there around I, I think i boil it down to celebrations i say this all the time we don't nearly celebrate enough the wins mm -hmm. and a celebration doesn't mean you always have to have a barbecue or a party or whatever do something you know there's no gifts doesn't always have to be gift of all it could just literally be the team at the end of the day like yeah. just acknowledging the fact that we hit our numbers today nobody got hurt and oh, here's another highlight that happened right um and so often you know i think linkedin is a good i've noticed the a shift in linkedin over the years has become more and more of a tool for showing the great stuff that companies are up to but if we could take that attitude and, and use it at the crew level i think you'd get a lot further with with folks being open like kathy said if you're not if you say don't don't come to me with that or if you shut it down they're never coming to you again with that right that brings me back to a, one of the episodes we had earlier in the year with um sandor and amanda Bass, so um or their miners at the face and one of their biggest things was you know we don't we don't train people enough on psychological safety and in our industry and if the supervisors supervisors are like a linchpin right if they don't provide the right environment for people to speak up nobody will speak up so that's key for our folks. I'm going to move on to the second question I've got for you folks here. It's a little bit kind of progressing here is, you know, statistically speaking across our industry, um, mining is, is great, right? And by all accounts, I mentioned earlier, most companies have, you know, around a one LTIF. Um, the issue now is that you've kind of flushed out a lot of the small stuff. And I think everybody on the call will, will understand the difference between preventing a fatality and preventing you know the ankle roll when the person's walking in the sidewalk from the dry to the, to the site right and so there's different levels of risk there and uh in our industry we've got you know across canada and and in both owner-led and contractor-led workforces we've got the technology the tools the programs you know why do you think or why do you believe that we still have serious injuries and fatality type incidents or even the near misses that almost kill a bunch of people um, and how can we be more inclusive and, you know, how could a more inclusive and a diverse work environment, you know, provide a, an improvement in that performance? I'll start with, uh, I'll start with uh, Teresa on this one. Sure. I mean, and I, um, you know, really one of why I was excited to do this webinar is, as you know, I'm the chairperson of the Diversity Inclusion Advisory Committee for CIM. So I really look at uh, the what what is the importance of diversity like wh why would why why do we why do we want companies or industry to harness what the, the the benefits that come with diversity so we know that diverse perspectives will enhance safety protocols if they are brought if you have the talent makeup to hear the to to be able to to hear those ideas so one of the things i just want to bring into this conversation is if you have the same people at the same tables um, with similar experience coming up with you know the, the, the solutions to the problems. Maybe what we're missing is the opportunity to to really harness what comes with diversity, which is people from different backgrounds. The other thing that I, I think is an opportunity for us in mining is always cross pollination between industries, adapting and adopting 
what other industries have done. So, you, you know, you listed the industries that you, you, you mentioned that, you know, we're doing better it, 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 as an industry, but, you know, who's doing the best? Who's out there? And what, what kind of cultures are they fostering that's leading to, you know, better data, better safety results? So I think one contribution I would say is, um, from my perspective, I think it's really important to not only speak about, you know, hey, we want diverse talent, we understand diverse perspectives, but understand that doing that takes a whole lot of intentionality and you actually have to recruit with that in mind and yeah. you need to put people in role with that thinking in mind. And therefore, as you build out the composition of your teams, you have to set yourself up to success to say, how can I get the most diverse perspectives when a problem happens? to solve it in a way that actually enhances our safety culture. Uh, so I, I would say that that's a lever that I would like to see more people uh, pursuing. Kathy, I saw you nodding your head there and, and leaning in. So you sounded like you wanted to say something. So, so oh, uh, uh, I'm just waiting right here. Yeah. Um, I put the safety training and the safety culture together um, because we were talking about it earlier about um, when you're training, safety it you have to admit sometimes it's pretty boring and as a safety instructor uh, what i always found was if you know your audience then it's the it's the, the 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 instructor's job to find out what's important to your audience and then use that in order to hook them in and what i was talking about was uh let's say the black bears up north here there's just about everybody in the in the room would have been a hunter at one time or another. So you, you start talking about black bears and what happens if you come face to face with a black bear. So my job as an instructor, you do all the background work so that you know what to tell them and say, well, you know, a black bear, when it huffs and puffs and all that, you know, they're, they're just trying to scare you. And what would you do if? So when you're bringing the audience in, they're going to say, well, I remember when I was hunting out for moose, I came across the black bear and this and this and this, what happened? After you've got their attention, then you can bring in women's and legislation and PPE and all the other things that they're, oh, they don't want to hear this again, et cetera, et cetera. But once you have them, then it's a lot easier to keep them. So I think that, that those two culture things would go together. Yeah, if I can just amplify what, uh, you know, what, what, what Carol just said. It's so important, you're absolutely right, to understand your audience. And that's part of understanding who is in your team and harnessing that diversity. But like to your point, you also have to make sure that you're not speaking out of context. I want to introduce, I want to really introduce the fact that we have a lot of people who are migrating from other countries into Canada who are coming uh, with, you know, a different perspective, different culture. So it's really important that the way that safety is taught is in such a way that is relatable to your employees that you have, that you actually have. And also, I think it's also important to understand that we, you know, when we talk about diversity and inclusion, uh, we got to remember that part of being inclusive is really acknowledging a, a fact that we know as people who were in grade one, two, three growing up, we are all different learners. And it is a doubt that even gets more exemplified. So I think it's really important when we talk about diversity, I mean, diversity, yes, we all look different, we come with different perspectives, but inclusion, how do I speak to the people in the language that they understand with their context? I tell you, not everybody hunts, like for example, not everybody hunts anymore. Not everybody plays, you know, baseball, the, the demographics are changing and you're gonna meet people where they are. Yeah, I agree. Excellent. John, I want to hear from you on this uh, as an ex uh, explosives expert. And... Well, I mean, I I totally agree with everything, and I and I think about where we are and the fact that we've we've kind of flatlined in terms of our safety performance. But at the same time, as an industry, we're going through a period of change. It, we're we're we have a huge opportunity uh, with critical minerals to grow. We have the in the ground. We've got governments behind us, but we're missing people and people is the factor that we need. So we need to be able to, and I think we're doing a good job of we're attracting. I just talked to you know, a client of mine this morning, reminded me that now in their 21% of their workforce is are people that they've attracted from other countries and successfully integrated into their team and very successfully integrated into their team. Other contractors that I've talked to this week that you know they're working in communities and, and over 20% of their workforce are indigenous because they've understood and they've figured it out. And, and I think it all comes down to that 
cultural side that if we can build that inclusive culture it's it's about the people we want to attract to the industry it's about the people that we want to retain to the industry but it's also about the people that i think trust has you know highlighted it you know we also have people that think differently that learn differently we have generational diversity we're trying to attract uh, gen z into the industry and and to, to come and, and see the opportunity in mining but but there's different expectations and if we can learn uh, as leaders to walk the talk in terms of creating a culture that is going to reflect on what we need for the future, that addresses the values that we need to, to address our, our, our climate change needs, that can address our net zero, that can adopt the technologies that are available to us right now to help us to do all that, and, and more importantly, to build the skills and the ownership around that, and it really comes down to the two things that most of the big studies and reports, whether it's ICMM or whether it's uh, the Mining Association, it comes down to leadership, culture, building a culture of respect, and inclusivity. And that takes a word that Teresa uses that I like very much, you know, an intentionality that, you know, we have to be going out and listen here, having conversations with people, listening people. And if we listen to them, we'll learn. We'll learn a lot. <laughs> we'll learn a lot about things that they know that we don't know. If we create the environment where they can collaborate with others, we'll create, we'll raise the bar in terms of our knowledge of what's possible and what we can do. We'll also raise our knowledge of risks and our awareness of risks and and, and we'll drive more uh, responsibility down in terms of ownership for the risk. And I think that's the big lever that an inclusive environment will do for us. It'll drive that ownership for identifying risk, managing risk to the front lines where it should be, because they know, <laughs> they know a lot. But unfortunately, yeah. sometimes our culture doesn't facilitate that psychological safety where they can come forward and talk about what they ought to be talking about. Yeah, thanks for that. And before we move on to, before I get Michelle to move on to poll number two, I just make a couple comments to summarize what I've heard. So I'm hearing intentionally create a learning organization Right. And and under underpinning that is is one where you've got a culture of respect and everybody's got a voice to speak up. And and as I'll say, I'll use the underground analogy, but it, it applies to anywhere before you step on the plant, before you go underground, before you operate a piece of equipment. Um, every person go, going from you know the hiring process into the classroom and the orientation training sounds like they should be getting I, I don't even want to say tools, I just want to say everything they need to know from a perspective of if I'm going to go do that work, I need to know what can kill me and what I need in place to prevent me from dying. Like that, mm -hmm. it's that it's got to be boiled down to something like that where they can get out in the field. And that's where this, the, this idea of this training program and creating a, a way to speak to folks um, yeah. until it resonates with them. There's a lot of great software tools out there now. And I, what I'm interested in is seeing what, what some of these companies that are promoting those learning management, they call them learning management systems. I like to say systems is more than just a piece of software, but the learning management software out there can do a lot these days, right? Where you can, it's not just all about e-learning, it's about creating a multimedia environment and you've got way, different ways to get the point across to people. And I've always heard from our communications folks at, uh, I used to work at um, Cameco, and I've heard the same thing from our folks in Torx here. It's like, you want to get a message across, the old adage in marketing is six to stick. So you got to hear something six times when you're learning it new. To, mm -hmm. to part to stick, and that's why those radio commercials always repeat themselves over and over and over again. Um, so, so Michelle, I'm going to ask you to pull up uh, poll number two. Uh, we're going to transition here to the next piece, and back to the audience now for your opinion. Uh, which aspect is most important to improve safety? So, if you're to select one of those, I know it probably is going to be a mix, but I want to see what the audience thinks here. <laughs> employee training awareness, teamwork, visible leadership commitment at all levels, better tech, more strict regs, strong culture of safety. We're about 78% voted. I'll give it a couple more seconds here. There's two clear leaders here. So Michelle, if you wanna pull up the, uh, the results. So visible leadership commitment at all levels, strong culture of safety those are the clear out front so what does that mean there's what does that mean to you folks john i want to start with you on that one based on the 
poll results of visible felt leadership commitment and strong culture of safety to those things what does that look like to you in an organization what that looks like to me i mean it's very easy to list and and every company has their values listed somewhere on our website they have it on the wall they talk about it they do in the introduction they talk about their values but it's really being out there as leaders in the organization and having conversations with people and reinforcing what's most important reinforce that behaviors that we're looking making and and more importantly listening and hearing back from people as to where they are what what are their needs what is their understanding I and mean, it's one thing for just to train people but as i always say you don't know for sure and communicate that they got it unless you go and stand beside them and stare them straight in the eye and have them explain back to you what is it that they understand is most important and if those conversations go on that reinforce the values of the organization that ensure that safety is not not ever to be compromised and the conversations that leadership have of that felt leadership of being out there and also being out there to recognize the good behaviors to tell people the good jobs we're doing and 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 thank people for the work that they're doing that's consistently reinforcing the behaviors that demonstrate the culture that and the values that we have committed to as an organization and it's just absolutely necessary because unless, and I call that, it's like an audit loop of making sure that if we say that safety is the most important thing, and if we say that we have procedures that we don't, that we have critical controls in place, every once in a while, leadership has to get out there and just say, are these really happening? Or is I, am I just not hearing back that they aren't? Because sometimes when serious, incident, serious in, injuries and fatalities happen, it's because we didn't hear back to what's not happening. And the only way to know for sure is go out there and have conversations and be intentional about those conversations that are reinforcing the right behaviors, thanking people for their contribution and reinforcing the values and the direction of the company. Thanks for that, John. Teresa, any commentary on that with respect to strong safety culture and visible leadership? Yeah, and, and you know, for me, like I, I, I've i been really learning a lot about culture and just trying to, you know, it's one of those things that are that are almost the intangibles, right? I, I like to give an example of, um, you know, there are things that are culturally normal for a person. As an example, you know, I, I'll give a dramatic example. If I say, you know, Nelson, I came by came by your office today, but none of you were there. Uh, but my goodness, it, it was smelly. There was garbage everywhere. Uh, you know, it was oh the the, the potent see if the smell was horrible. You would say, Tressa, I don't know what floor you got off on, <laughs> but that is not our office. That is not who we are. We actually have a very clean office and whatnot. So with culture, it's one of those things where it's one thing to say who you say you are and your values, but the reality is it's, it shows up in your actions and how you, you how you behave and the symbols that people see uh, will, will tell them more about your culture than you, you ever can. So to this point about visible leadership, I mean, at the end of the day, I think for, um, for employees, for, for any of us, it's about what you see happen. So what does happen when people don't follow the safety rules? What happens to them? But what about if they don't follow safety and they get the job done? What happens? You know, do they get applauded that, well, at least you got it done? So I think culture is this, that can, can be this like um, obscure, um, word for many people but i think sometimes when you think of the culture you that you don't identify with it can really help you understand the the culture and the symbols you want to demonstrate so we talk about what's a great culture what, what's a good visible visible leadership well it's in what you do and what people see you do that help them create what yep. they call the culture okay and, and john if i may if i if i just add one more thing you know, it's like when people talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and they say, I'm an ally of that subject. And people say, hey, stop calling yourself an ally until the people of the lived experience say, hey, Nelson, in your actions, we consider you an ally. You know, so it's the same thing with the safety culture. It's, I think it's, it's a dangerous thing to say, oh, we have a great thing. Let it, let it show up in your actions. Let people see it. Yeah. And thanks for that, Teresa. And, and Kathy, from your perspective and your well, experience, what would you like to have seen or what do you believe makes a strong safety culture and what, what does visible felt leadership look like to you? Well, back in my time, they, we didn't have that kind of uh, diversity because if there were a person of color, there might have been four 
at Inco and maybe two indigenous. Everybody else was white, but they were in their own groups. Italians were in their groups, Irish were in their groups, Polish were in their groups, everybody sat in their groups. But we didn't have to learn anything because we all grew up the same way. Now in Sudbury, you just mm -hmm. have to go to the schools. There's people of color, there's indigenous people, there's people wearing different kinds of clothing, which here in the North still turns heads, right? So we, as myself, like as an elderly person, we have to learn people's cultures. So we're hoping that they share that with us. And one thing when I was growing up, my dad always said, everybody bleeds. In other words, it doesn't matter if you uh, have a darker skin or if you got lighter skin or if you're indigenous, if you get hurt on the job, you're going to be injured just like everybody else. And I'm thinking that I would like to just sit in on some of these meetings just to learn um, the different kinds of cultures that are coming into our city. And that would be a little easier to do a safety talk when you know who your audience is. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and just to, uh, to amplify, I think what you're saying there as well. Um, you know, we're so we're so lucky. We live in this in this age where, with a with a few keystrokes and the correct websites, you can get some real accurate information about different parts of the world and even some of what are some of the cultural norms. Uh, one thing I want to bring up is, you know, this uh, concept around the like, power distance. In some cultures, like if you are my leader, I do not argue with you. You know, you are my leader. You guide me. I trust you. Uh, and and my my sign of respect is to agree to what you say. And to you know Carol's point, it's absolutely critical. Kathy, sorry, Kathy. To <laughs> Kathy's point, it's absolutely critical that you understand who's on your team because if somebody has come in with a certain mindset about leadership. And you're thinking, well, listen, I'm used to people challenging me. If I say something and I'm wrong, my my expectation is my team is going to challenge me. If you end up with people on your teams who are showing you respect by not challenging you, you can see where we with where the safety can break down, right? So yes. they're very sure. good point, Kathy. Yeah. 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 And just, so great points, folks. Like I I have a, my own experience for the last ten years working in Mexico, and ultimately being an outsider right because I don't look like anybody in Mexico and um, but when I do get to go to Mexico and, and catch up with my teammates and, and my peers and the folks that report into me and um, it's always interesting I there are a lot of folks there what it'll call a jefe culture and you don't like like Teresa said you don't question the boss if the boss asks you to do something you just go do it and you find a way to do it and and sometimes that means cutting corners and so what I what I always say to new folks um, at our current organization here is Torex is like be careful what you ask for and really focus on your task assignment because mm -hmm. whatever you ask for you're going to get and so you're going to make sure that you think about how you're asking for things and and you know and, and everybody everybody I've worked with whether it's been in Kazakhstan or South Africa or uh, Mexico or northern northern Saskatchewan um, at the end of the day everybody wants to get home to their to do their own thing, right? They want to get home with their family, their friends, their their trip they're going on, and and so it's uh, you know creating that environment where people can go do that is is ultimately what I what I love doing about what I love about mining is everybody's rowing in the same direction. At least that's been my experience or my career. Right? Um, what I what I what I've been trying to stay away from are organizations that say you know safety is important, but and I think that comes to I think it was something that uh, Teresa or Kathy was saying just earlier on the, the response to the poll was. You know, when somebody breaks a safety rule, what happens, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't enforce it, it's not a rule. So, um, and, and and again, it's not only about just blaming the person who broke the safety rule. You gotta understand why they broke the safety rule. Is it a common thing or is it a one-off? Or did they not understand? Is there a gap in training? There's always there's always more before you can go attack the person for doing the wrong thing, because uh, you know, I'm one of the worst offenders. I'm a human being too. I make lots of mistakes as I go. So. Uh, I do want to end with before we jump into the Q and A section, uh, with respect to just a question for you folks. You know, last one I've got for you today is, you know, how do you believe these social aspects? We're talking a lot about like abstracted, you know, broad, somewhat esoteric concepts of culture and and how people feel about it and and how people observe it and and of course then you start getting in the 
to the DEI waters and everybody's having their own opinion on that. So, or their own point of view on that and their own lived experience. So how do you believe the social aspects of our workplace of our workplaces are changing and and what should our team leaders and team members you know on both ends the, the folks the folks supervising the folks doing the work that at the face if you will across the industry what we should what we should be focused on you know each day to improve health and safety um like ultimately the goal the the you know the, i think our collective goal in the industry i've done worked at one company that's never said zero lives lost zero lives harmed or zero lives changed by an injury, right? So, so what are what are the social aspects of the workplaces that have that as those change? What should our team leaders, what should our team members um, be focused on each day to improve safety? That's so boil that down to that. Mm -hmm. I'll start with Kathy on this one. Well, you said goals, but that's not what it says on your paper. <laughs> on your paper, it says each and every day improve health and safety programs that will result in zero lives lost or zero lives lives harmed well it kind of sounds like a sales pitch i don't want to be rude but that's what it sounds like to me because in the mining industry and construction workers and logging and firefighters police people all of those jobs come with danger and it's part of the territory so this here when you say if you do this 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 and this the result is going to be zero. Well, sorry to bust your bubble, but that's not gonna happen. Accidents are still gonna happen on these kinds of jobs, but what we could do is minimize them. When I read this, I was thinking it over in my head, and it's like it's a dream or a goal that we have that we'd like to get to zero. It's like buying a lottery ticket. Just because you bought a lottery ticket, that doesn't mean you're going to win the million dollars. All it means is that you have a chance to win the million dollars. Your goal, your dream is to win the million dollars. So by changing that to our goal is zero, but in order to get there, let's minimize accidents, incidents, and fatalities. So that had to be changed because when I went back to your other paper over here, you said, however, mining companies regularly experience fatalities and serious injuries across Canada. So the word regularly is a definite pattern. So that's the clue right there. There's a pattern that somehow we're in that's causing us to have fatalities and accidents and that. What is the pattern? How do we change that pattern? So that's something that I, I'd like to, us to look at in the future. So that's all I'm gonna to say to that. That's excellent. So I'd like to look at that right now. Teresa, any commentary on that? Or John, whoever wants to jump in. Hey John, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, no, I, I think it's, you know, and I went, I started, when we started this off, I said, you know, back when I could talk about, you know, 25 years of the lost time in, industry and manufacturing operations, people in mining said, no way, but now, we are progressing towards that. And I think that pursuit of zero harm, that's a pursuit and that commitment to zero fatalities is what's causing us to learn every day. And we've learned a lot from, I would say, the engineering, the science side about managing safety. But I think we're at a transition point now on the people side, that if we can get people more engaged, if we can get people more involved, if we can understand where people come from you know the old stephen covey seek first to understand then to be understood if we can listen to people if we can hear people if we can get to know them from their diverse backgrounds their experience uh, there's a thing we use in our leadership training that says behavior is caused if, beha if people act a certain way there's a reason for it something happened to them in their life we all didn't start off being pro safety against safety pro this pro that we've learned it in our life you know and let's get to know people get to understand and i'd say if there's one thing we have to do we have to flip that switch in many of our uh, discussions. Uh, Nelson, I know you're aware of the Bradley curve, but it's that cultural transition of where we go to safety, that pursuit of zero. We have to get to the, the leadership and the cultural side where people are actually involved and engaged. And there's tons and tons of studies that show when, when an organization is on the high end of the engagement scale, that the safety performance is, is 20, 30, 
percent better than it is a non-engaged organization. So how do we build a culture where all of our employees are engaged, all of our people understand the importance of safety? The interesting thing is if you focus on that safety culture and you actually build it, you get production, you get quality, you get innovation, you get all the other things because we build a people environment where people don't just bring their hands, they bring their hearts and their minds to work every day. And they're working, all working in the same direction. And I think that to me is that next transition that we have as, as an industry, that we have to flip that switch to the people side and make sure that everybody that comes to work in the mining industry is, is included, feels like they belong, is respected and is heard. And if we do that, there's no limit to what we can do. And that, that curve will continue to progress towards zero to the point when, Kathy, I'm still believing we're gonna get there. <laughs> So I got two two counterpoints there, right? One is that stuff's gonna happen and people are still gonna get injured and we can still we can still get it. Teresa, weigh in where on this. Yeah, weigh well, on this for me. So where I am, and, and I just wanna introduce uh, maybe a word here. It's, it's really what I call like self-leadership and a desire for self, like radical self-advocacy. And what I mean by that is, in my opinion, uh, many times, depending on your experience level, you really know how to do your job. And if you've been well trained, you know what choices you need to make consistently to remain safe. Now, in moments where you are alone and you need to make a decision, all of that training, your own personal value system is what is going to translate into action. So I really want to emphasize that the industry, of course, you know, systems, processes, train up leaders, 100% agree, 100% aligned. But I really want to speak to the to the employee, the person who, is, the employees, the people who are doing the work, the boots on the ground, that self-advocacy and the courage. I think it does take courage depending on, you know, depending on the teams you're in, it, it's gonna be a complete act of bravery to speak up when you see a safety deficiency. And it might even come with a risk, right? So the reality is, I think one of the things I'm excited about is when I you know, speak to my, you know, when I mentor people who are coming up in industry, is this idea of like self-advocacy, self-leadership, making the decisions that will see you thrive in the industry of your choice. And it translates back to safety. Now, is do we live in a utopic world where every time somebody brings up a safety concern, there's no you're not gonna ever hear of they brought up a safety concern and then they felt a certain way about how it was received. The reality is uh, you can't guarantee what teams you end up in. What you can guarantee is yourself, your personal values, and what you will put up with and what you will not put up with. Because at the end of the day, I, I really believe in that locus of control, and that is uh, you know, seek out companies, company culture that resonate with your personal values and exercise a lot of self-leadership and understand it can come with some consequences, but it is absolutely worth it to, to be a value-driven person. Well, there's, a, there's a broad range, there's a diverse range of, uh, of opinions here. <laughs> I, I will push back with like a hard stop on that. I, I truly believe and and i would never like i would always with my team say we are getting home safe today and we're going down we're going underground we're doing this here's what we're setting up you set the team up um and then it's uh you know i treat it like a little bit of a game right like a sports event like where you're getting you got your pre-game get into the game you're performing and you're looking for ways to adjust read and react to the play as things change to keep people safe over the day over the course of the shift the week the month um and, and so my 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 vision of you know we talk about this shared vision of zero harm, like I'm like nobody dies, nobody gets maimed. That's where we're starting, right there, right. Um, mm -hmm. We know we know stuff's gonna happen. Somebody's gonna roll an ankle, or but but nobody's getting a multiple fracture on their leg today because the you know the the cement block tipped over, or the the ground the ground failed. Like that's and I think that's where visible felt leadership. And I got a really strong opinion on this one, but visible felt leadership. That is like the linchpin of a safety culture. When we talk about culture, what is it? I think Teresa, you were mentioning it earlier, like it's the experiences people have and that they and they then talk about about how they feel about management, what it's like to work at a place, what that location's like, because because companies with many multiple locations will have different 
subcultures as well, right? Um, and so, but I do, I always, I love having those convers these conversations, Kathy, because I've had them in the field at the face where they're like, how are we, I had a guy one time say to me, how are we going to compete with Chinese companies in Canada if we're not just going to, we have too many safety officers walking around. And, and I was like, oh man, come on. Like, well, let's talk about how we can make it safer. But I, I would, uh, and I know CIM is getting up to this down the road, but I would love to see the statistics. I, I think there's lots of them out there that we can pull up that, and we know this, I know this from lived experience as well, like safe organizations are more productive organizations and you can make it safe and there are critical controls. That's why I'm coming back to what can kill me and what are the things that prevent me from dying? And if everybody knows that and they all work together as a team, this is where it got, comes back to that the DEI aspect, right? If everybody can speak up and they feel safe speaking up, can we do it? Like, is that what we're missing, right? And and I have to I have to comment. Like, I know that uh, there's other CIM things going on today, but the other the focus in the energy industry seems to be on the theory and on how the tech and on the and I think the culture is the biggest piece of this. Is how do you get every brain in the game, every single shift? And when it comes to critical decisions that are life and death in a mine, when you're working near an ore pass or you work from heights, what do you got to do, right? So we've got about 10 minutes left. I have two comments coming in, um, but I'm going to I'm gonna open with a, just a Q&A section here as we jump into it. Um, any further final comments before we move on to the, the, the final piece here for the audience to start asking questions? And this is a call to the audience who's who's still on the phone. If you're still here for the last 10 minutes of this webinar, we're we're getting in the QA. So start firing me your questions and I'll I'll curate them and ask them to the team here. Any closing comments, Teresa, Kathy, John? Um, you mean closing for the whole the whole thing? Just just from your perspective on what we've talked about today. Um, any well, words I had a great time. I, I've had a wonderful time. Thank you for inviting me. I uh, it got my blood boiling again, and I do like discussions. Uh, I I do really enjoy that. And uh, we're not done yet. Oh, we're uh, not done. Not done yet. No. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, then I'll wait till later. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, not a question, a comment. Okay, I've got a couple comments. There. I'll I'll read those out near the end. But so, all right. So here's a question for you, folks, to kick things off. Um, what are the top one to three things you would tell a mining executive or a frontline worker? And let me know who you're talking to in this imagined scenario. Um, uh, you know, a frontline team leader to focus on to create a more inclusive culture where people feel connected to their teammates, where they'll give their best every shift so everybody gets home safe to their friends and family. We're on that topic. Anybody want to jump on that one for me? What are the top okay. one to three things you would tell a mining leader, either at, at the executive level or somebody that's leading a team at the face? What I like to see an executive member do is to go underground, full gear. I'd like him or her to sit on a scoop trap while it's running. And I'd also <laughs> like them to bring their lunch and sit down with the people in the lunchroom and have lunch and have a discussion on that level rather than in an office setting or in a school setting. I think sitting around talking to miners would be a, would be good on both sides. Get out in the field, connecting with people is on here and there. Let's sum that up, yep. John, okay. Teresa? And I would say the same thing. It's really, whether you're, you're executive or you're front in line, it's, it's making the time to have the conversations with your people that you're really there to, to learn, to understand, to understand what their concerns are, um, <clears throat> to provide them any feedback that they need, and I think the most important aspect about that is that when you hear a concern, when you hear something needs to be addressed, to take action and make sure that within days of that conversation, that interaction, whether you're a frontline super or you're executive, that there's action taken so that people know that they have been heard and that their, their voice is not just uh, welcome, it's needed uh, for us to get to that next level of, of both safety. And I think you made the comment earlier, but it, it, it also drives production. It drives everything. If we have an engaged workforce, and, but we have to have the conversations and we have to earn the trust and we have to, um, create that, uh, safety, uh, net where people, people want to bring their, their thoughts forward. Teresa. 
Yeah, no, I'm I'm hundred percent aligned with the comments. Yeah. Yep. Okay, I've got a couple of uh, questions that are filtered in since we've been talking. Um, how is psychological safety incorporated into safety plans? And how would you address psychological injuries? Teresa, maybe we could start with you on that one. You're, you're representing the DEI committee and, and the tools that, the, that CIM has available. So how, any thoughts on that? Yeah, to, you know, to me, when I think of psychological safety, again, I, I really have to lean back on psychological safety for me is fostered in the tangible actions you're taking. Uh, I mean, yes, of course, you should always amplify everything with specific training. That's a great foundation. But what actually helps people is seeing things in motion. So what I would say is um, it's really around make it known when you are listening to people and you're following through on what they've brought up. And I just, I hesitate to only think of training as the solution because I think human beings, we're, you know, many of us who are able, able vision, you, you really do see, you, you see it, psychological safety is one of those situations where it's what you feel based on what you see and the behaviors you see. So I do think that it's really good for us to um, put into practice our actions and, and even really identify those moments where you have, you know, listen to somebody and, and get people uh, comfortable with this idea of listening to each other and highlighting and, and reflecting and you know this idea of recognition recognizing people when they're listening to each other where people have had opposing views but it's they've still managed to continue working together i do love the fact that whoever the person who's asked this question about psychological injury you know we we are an industry that is highly focused on mental health um i see lots of evidence in this um you know we we from people across the industry that i talk to you can see that many companies have really adopted this idea that uh, mental health is quite is equally important to physical health and i my personal view is it's important to uh what do you call it like lift the lid on mental health where we uh it's not something shameful. And we see more and more leaders talking about mental health, talking about burnout, talking about uh, you know things that have happened in their careers. So let's normalize talking about uh, psychological injuries in a way that people can see that it's safe to do so. Yeah, uh, very good point. I think it's very, very important that that people get, we get to know our workers. We get to know who they are and if, if if leaders go out there and they want to get to know their 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 people as people, then it's a question of going out and like, how are you doing? And letting people know you care. That is probably the biggest and most important thing that we can do to build that psychological safe, safe environment uh, for people to prosper. But also, it also facilitates an environment where people will come forward when they need help versus hiding it and burying it. And let, results in burnout and, and mental health issues, drugs, all kinds of things that are happening and do happen. And just because people don't feel comfortable that there's someone there that they can connect with that cares. Mm -hmm. And if we have that as a foundation, if people are our foundation and, and they know that we care, they'll be safe. Right. Kathy, any commentary? Yeah, you know, like if people just cared a little bit, say that, uh, Pete comes in and looks really tired, you know, he hasn't slept all night. And maybe George says, hey, what's going on, bud? You know, you look a little tired. Yeah, I've been up all night with that baby. She's teething, you know, and haven't slept a wink. Then George could say, yeah, you know, I've been there. I had children. Yes, I know teething is a bummer. But just remember, this too will pass. You know, if you need anything, you know, I'll be just over here. So just by acknowledging that's this man is tired, that he's having a bad day. I think that showing a little compassion like that will go a long way. And then maybe his day will change as well. Great. So there's about Sorry. one minute left. There's a few other questions here and I'll, I'll address them offline. They're not necessarily relevant to the topic today. Like there's, there's a few commentaries, there's a few things or a few things in here about requesting um, uh, or information, so that's directed at you, John. But I'll I'll make sure that gets sent to you, and we can get back to the person that asked that. 
Um, but I think as we close with a minute left, thank you so much, folks, for participating in this discussion. And I think it's a, it's a, it's an, a, I, I don't want to say it's emerging. I think this has been around for a while, and I think we, we all know that the better companies get at that, the better we'll be at safety. But I'll turn it over to Michelle to close off today's uh, session at the top of the hour. Thanks so much. Uh, oh, one thing I'd like to say, though, um, I'm not getting paid for this, <laughs> so I'm going to promote my book. All right. It's yeah. called My View from the Black and Rocks, and you can get it on Amazon, on Indigo, and on Barnes and Noble. Yeah. Well, thanks, <laughs> Thank you. thanks to Equinox Gold as well for sponsoring today's episode. Go ahead, Michelle. Thanks, Nelson. <laughs> thanks, Nelson. Thank you to Kathy, Teresa, oh. and John. And thank you to Equinox Gold for sponsoring today's webinar. I'd like to thank all of our attendees and ask that you please fill out the short survey that pops up on your screen at the close of the webinar. A link to the video recording of this webinar will be emailed to you tomorrow, along with a link to register for the next episode of the Safety Share on December 14th. Guest Samantha Esplay, a Health and Safety Society Chair, and Brian Wilson, the Vice Chair, will join us to recap what CIM's Health and Safety Society was up to in 2023 and how Canadian miners can rely on the Health and Safety Society to help improve their health and safety performance in 2024. We hope to see you there. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>